All right. Uh, so, um, and what I wanted to draw your attention to, just to, to get started here, is down in the corner, you're going to see some things you may not have seen associated with MERS, for those of you who have been with us for a while. So you're going to see a logo of Sphere. You're going to see the logo of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. And you're going to see the logo of the MERS. And the reason for that is because the MERS has always been associated or at least in, since 2015, has been associated with the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, which is a part of the Sphere Network. So that relationship has been longstanding. But what we are doing now and what's changing and shifting in that relationship is the MERS are going to be homed. They are going to be a part of, integrally connected to Sphere at this point. So this will be the first time one of a partner standards a uh, sector specific standard will become a part of the sphere network intrinsically there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that during the session. But before we get too deep into that, let's look at what we will talk about. So Dan, let's go to the next slide and the one after that. And we'll introduce ourselves. Hello, everyone. Oh, there we go. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, this is me. I am, uh, I know many of you, but not all. Um, I've seen a lot of people introducing themselves in the chat who've been with us and a part of this group for a long time, but also a lot of new learners. So that's fantastic. Um, Eduardo just Eduardo just said he's a new learner, and that's great. So welcome. Um, I have been a consultant and involved with Immerse since its inception. So I've been here a long time, since uh, 2005, I think. Um, which is, and we'll hear a little bit about the history of the MERS. And then we have William Anderson, who you'll see on your screen, and he is the executive director of Sphere, and we'll hear from him. And then you have Anne, who is really our star speaker today, and Anne will be with us to talk about using the MERS, applying the MERS in the field, and how they can affect, improve, and help us learn about programming. So that's really what we're going to do. We can go to the next slide, which will give us a sense of who we have with us today. We've got about 70 people already in the room with us. So let's go to the quick poll. So Dan, do we click on, on our right-hand side of the screen where it says polls? Do we by any chance click on that button and take the poll? Yes, I just brought it out live now. So you can Thank see you. the first question and I'll bring out the second one too. So I would love all of us to take a few minutes. If you're on your phone, I have no idea what you're seeing. But if you're on your computer, <laughs> you should have had a little pop up there. And if you didn't, you can click on the polls, which is right next to chat, right? And you can answer yes or no. And then once you've done that, so I answered yes, because I do know the MERS and I have in fact used it in my work, strangely enough. And then I've submitted my responses. And then we can see as we're going through, we've got, you know, about half of you have voted so far and more then, you know, more than half of you are new to this space and are sort of learning about the MERS, which is interesting and, and good. I'm, I'm really always pleased to see more people learning and new than people who have seen it before. Um, so I think if we go down, so that seems to have been static. So we've got a little bit more folks who are new, but it's kind of a half and half group. So let's go to the next question. If we can, Dan. Yeah, second question's out too. Oh, there it is. And there it is down there. So if you scroll down, see? See, it's good that I'm new to this platform too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> learn together. <laughs> I'm asking the questions that you might be asking too. So this is the first time I've been introduced to the MERS. And it is not the first time I've been introduced to the MERS. So there we go. So for many people, it is not the first time they've been introduced to it. But it's not something they have always used. Oh, it's 50-50 now, using it in your work. That is a miracle to me. I think that's wonderful. If that's mm. true, then I'm feeling very positive about the MERS. <laughs> if half yes. of the people on the call have used it in their work, I can't, I couldn't be happier. Um, that's great. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. That that helps us who are doing Welcome. this presentation understand who's in the room, what the group is about, you know, and where we are, and and we can help set the tone as we go forward, knowing that half of you are new to this tool, but half of you have already used it in your work. So I think that's a, I think that's a good place for us to start. It helps us understand where to focus. So let's go to the next slide and let's see what we are going to do. 
So our agenda is this short introduction of the MERS, and that's me, Sarah, and I'll be doing that. And William will be joining me in a moment to, to speak a little bit about this new relationship, and I'll introduce him right after we go through this agenda. Um, and then Anne will talk us through the DREAMS program, where they did a really active and engaged and, and long-term relationship with the MERS and moving it through the DREAMS program. And then we'll have a breakout room activity, which is where you guys will interact with the MERS, and you're going to be looking at a specific case study, which will be very brief and having a chance to really look at the standards and access them. And we'll help you through that in the breakout rooms. Then we'll come back from the breakout rooms and have a chat about what happened, a, sort of a brief wrap up, very brief. And then we'll go into Q&A and we'll dedicate a good portion of time to the Q&A. So I just want to encourage you, um, we're many in the room, there's over 70 people in the room now. So use that Q&A button over there where it says chat polls people Q&A. As topics or questions pop up, if they're specific, like where was the DREAMS program again, or how do I get the MERS, or you know, why does this woman talk so much, you can put it right in the chat. Um, uh, sorry, I apologize. Do not put it in the chat, please. <laughs> put it in the Q&A, um, because that really, we're going to leave a lot of time at the end. People will also be welcome to unmute themselves and ask questions at the end of the session, and we'll leave time for that. But as they come up, please do put them in the Q&A because that will help us stay uh, focused as we go forward. So that's what our agenda looks like. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to William and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself, tell him, tell us a little bit about who he is at Sphere and when he arrived, and then talk through a little bit about how he feels and how Sphere feels about this new relationship between the minimum economic recovery standards and the sphere network and the humanitarian standards partnership william please go right ahead thank you very much and yeah particularly thanks to daniel and sarah for giving me a few minutes to share this afternoon this morning this evening and a shout out as well to tristan tristan hale who's the head of communications at sphere and he's also on the call so i'm going to take this opportunity to either give a refresher or perhaps for some people a new, just a quick summary of what is Sphere, and then I'll go into HSP and our relationship with MERS. So since its inception, Sphere has stood unwaveringly for quality and accountability in humanitarian assistance. And it's been the standard bearer for human dignity, no matter the context, and through the humanitarian charter, it sets out a rights-based framework, which is and has been used by countless thousands of frontline, technical, policy, advocacy, and many other um, roles of aid workers. So that there is a sphere handbook. There are three foundation chapters and four technical chapters. A quick summary. The, the first chapter is the humanitarian charter, and this provides the foundation for principled humanitarian action. It gives an overview of the right to life with dignity, the right to receive humanitarian assistance, and the right to protection and security. So the, the second chapter is, in fact, the four protection principles, which talks about safety, dignity, and rights of crisis-affected people. And it provides an overview for the role of humanitarian actors to encourage the authorities to fulfill their legal responsibilities for the welfare of people in their jurisdiction or state. And if and when they fail to do so, the role of humanitarians to assist people in need, and specifically to assist people in need to stay safe, to access assistance, to recover from violence, and to claim their rights. And the third foundation chapter is the core humanitarian standard. And this provides nine commitments made by organizations involved in disaster response to communities and people affected by crisis. And it includes, for example, commitments about appropriateness, relevance, timeliness, uh, participation, and includes practical things like a complaints mechanism. The four technical chapters are, and I'll just read them out, water supply, sanitation, and hygiene promotion, food security and nutrition, shelter and settlement, and health. 
Now, the, the sphere has a secretariat. It's based in Geneva, and we have six, strict, sometimes seven staff. Um, and we're involved in training and learning, in communication, in partnerships, policy and advocacy, and other areas. And over this last year, um, we've been writing a new theory of change. And this is for our 24-25 plan. And we're going to be focusing on technology, training, and quality. Technology to make the handbook as user-friendly and as accessible as possible. So this includes and particularly in, is about website and applications. So the interactive handbook and the app. And in fact, there is a, an app for the HSP, which if you have a smartphone, you can download um, uh, on Android or or Apple or other platforms, you can download the HSP app now. So technology, and we'll hopefully be using AI as well, and Tristan is the expert on that. Training, we really want to be um, awareness raising, we want to be supporting focal points, listed trainers, and providing resources for learning. So this is all about online, but also in person. And we, we have courses ranging from one hour to five days. And quality will be highlighting that we're, that we're advocating for minimum standards for life with human dignity. So they're not minimum standards in terms of as, as low as we can go. No, they're minimum standards for life with dignity. And that's a crucial point about minimum standards. So our four objectives for the next two years is the Sphere Handbook, where we want to increase awareness, and effective use of the humanitarian charter and the minimum standards. We want to be um, really focusing on strategic partnerships. We want to align and we want to promote cross-sectoral humanitarian minimum standards. We want to increase our work in policy and advocacy to advocate for greater commitment to quality, particularly in humanitarian policy and in humanitarian practice. And our fourth stream is the Champions Network where we want to improve and support local ownership of humanitarian standards. So as, Sphere, as Sarah had mentioned, Sphere is the host and the coordinator of the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. Um, this is an informal network of 10 standard setting initiatives and organizations. Uh, we support quality and accountability in humanitarian action by promoting the harmonized development and cross-sectoral use of standards. And we have, the HSP has nine sets of humanitarian standards, and they were all developed in a similarly inclusive and consultative manner. And you can see across the sets of standards how harmonized and aligned they are. So I'll just also list them now, just in case. So we have the Sphere Handbook, and of course we have the Minimum Economic Recovery Standards, as well, we have the minimum standard for market analysis, which has been developed by the CALP network, uh, the child protection minimum standards, which is developed by the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, minimum standards for education, which was developed by the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, the Livestock Emergency Guidelines and Standards, and humanitarian inclusion standards for older people and people with disabilities, and the minimum standards for camp management. And that was developed by the Camp Coordination and Camp Management Cluster, particularly with IOM. And then finally, um, the most recent standard was the standards for supporting crop-related livelihoods in emergencies, or SEEDS. So as Sarah said, it's been nearly 15 years uh, since the HSP was formed. And it's now an increasingly vibrant group of 10 standard setting initiatives and organizations. And in the next couple of years, we really want to see the HSP increase visibility of the partnership within the sector. And I have to say to my shame, before I joined Sphere, I'd never actually heard of the HSP, but so it's gonna be my, my, my job and the Sphere Secretariat's job, along with others, to really increase the visibility of the HSP and go on a journey of even greater harmonization and simplification. Now, when the MERS first edition came out in February 2009, and including the second edition, 2013, the third edition, 2017, they all have um, introductory chapters, which, as Sarah said, um, provides a short history of the MERS, and in particular, cites the very close relationship with Sphere from the start. 
And from the outset, even before that February 2009 first edition of the MERS, Sphere was one of the three main websites for consultation on it. So the three websites were the Relief Web, Sphere, and a, a website I've never heard of called Microlinks. But anyway, we won't get into that. So when the, the SEEP network dissolved a couple of years ago, a tender was opened up this year um, to find a new host. And it was, I think it was only natural and right for Sphere to step up and offer our support. We're still at the early days, um, but Sphere, I can assure you, is really grateful and excited to be on this journey together with the MERS, the MERS Advisory Committee, and the Markets in Crisis team. Now, if I may, I also want to end um, by just sharing that I did um, due diligence and due compliance and researched uh, the MERS throughout the years. And I quickly realized it's actually been um, in existence for much longer than 2009. So in fact, there are some 2000 year old texts which reveal, for example, that wise people from the East, when they went traveling, they often carried with them gifts for certain dignitaries. And these included gold, frankincense, and myrrhs. Um, I apologize. I'm a father of three. Terrible dad joke to end on. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. Oh, see, now I, I was like, oh, gee, where are we going with this? I was like, oh, good, we're going there. That was a much good, that was a good place to go with that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, William. And, um, and I really, I appreciate the time and energy and work we've all put in to finding a path together. So one of the things that um, the MERS Advisory Committee, um, as I said, the MERS have been around a long time. We started this thinking back in 2005, and some of you here have been involved in a long, for a long time with these, with these standards. And so we're really on a co-creation journey together with the advisory committee and other stakeholders to figure out the very best way, the most effective way to make this partnership work. And we're hoping that by having the MERS really fold into the SEEP network and the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, it will point a path for other standards to have similar conversations and create um, an integrated and more connected and hopefully simpler path for practitioners to follow to improve their practice. Um, so that that's what that's where we are with that process. And and from now on, uh, for those of you on this call and those of you out in in the world who are doing this important work, Sphere will be the main point of contact for MERS going forward. And when we get to the end of the presentation, you will see that Sphere's information is there. And so that's really how this is going to move forward with the Sphere team. Um, you'll be contacted by them for trainings. You'll be informed about webinars. You'll be new products coming out around the MERS. That will be what uh, Sphere is bringing to you. So just to be on the lookout for that coming very, very soon. Um, so what I'd like to do now is take a short break from the talking heads and watch a very brief video. And the reason I wanna do this is because most of you are going to have some familiarity with market systems and emergencies, but you're all at a radically different place. Some of you may do market systems work as your day to day. Some of you may be in a new emergency situation where before you were working in a more stable environment. Some of you may be uh, working in WASH or working in health and recognizing that market systems are a really important part of what you do and wanting to learn more. So I'd like to play this video, which really does help just put us in a place where we can all have a similar understanding about why market systems work is important in emergency and crisis. And so, Dan, if I can ask you to play that video for us. All around the world, people depend on markets for their lives and livelihoods. And mostly, market systems can adapt to changing conditions. A bad harvest locally can often be compensated by surplus from another area a little further away. When an emergency happens, if markets are functioning well, we can give cash or vouchers to those affected so they can buy what they need. And if markets are not functioning well enough to meet the needs, 
we might also need to deliver assistance ourselves with our own supply chains. Then, when markets are functioning again, we can go back to delivering with the local market system. It's important to be agile and be able to switch when we need to. But what more could we do? How could we help local markets recover faster? This might mean improving the supply chain while we're delivering humanitarian assistance. Helping small distributors or traders with access to fuel so they can keep delivering. Or even giving cash grants to producers to help them replace lost livestock or increase production to meet the needs. And how can we strengthen markets before an emergency so they are more resilient? Okay, we don't often know exactly where an emergency will happen, but we do know our most vulnerable countries where emergencies happen most often. We can assess their market systems before the next emergency, look back at how it functioned in the last crisis, and we can work with others to identify opportunities for market strengthening. There might be big things we can do, like improving infrastructure, strengthening critical roads, transport routes. We might be able to support small traders or groups of traders in critical markets. Whether they're struggling with storage, transport, distribution and scale, access to credit, skills, or even equipment. There are lots of things we can do to strengthen vulnerable markets and make the whole supply chain more resilient to the next emergency. To strengthen markets, we need to know our vulnerable supply chains and invest in improvements now before the next emergency happens. Thank you so much. And a lot of you will say, yep, that's what we do, you know, and that's correct. And that's some pretty basic information. And some of you may say that was helpful. And maybe I might want to share that video with some of my teams downstream because it is a nice, easy sort of setup. My favorite part about that video is the little click every time it says, oh, look, we did that. Oh, we took care of that. Oh, we took care of that. And I always say, oh, if only it was so easy. Now, this is what I do every day. This is my this is my day to day work. And and I, I never quickly sort of like, oh, yes, we'll just improve storage. Click. Oh, good. All set then. <laughs> I was like, oh, I just wish it did work that way. But it doesn't. <laughs> we can go to the next slide. So all of those things um, that were talked about sort of when when that video says you could do this, you could improve finances. You know, you could improve access to financial services. You could improve uh, working with groups of traders. You can use facilitation approaches. Uh, you could work with infrastructure. You could work with industry groups. These are all things that are in the MERS. And this is why the MERS was developed, is to help people and practitioners and leaders in emergencies make sure that we are doing all of those things in an emergency uh, environment before and after and during. And the MERS were written for practitioners and by practitioners. And that, that is one of the things that I think um, in the standards and as part of SPHERE was really important. So it is something that has case studies. It has be best practices in it. It is written with the simplest language possible. Um, there are priorities across the themes. So the best practice is there. There are cross-cutting priorities. There's a language that can be clear to both market systems people and livelihoods people, as well as people who are humanitarian practitioners who are non-sector specific, people who work um, across emergencies regardless of, of the technical sector. It has language and tools and terms that can be applied and understood by everyone. So if you can click again, Dan, because I think this one is one of those exciting um, one, there you go. So, <laughs> so it is something that was developed over the years by over 90 organizations and 175 practitioners across seven countries with different um, interventions around information gathering and revision and improvement. 
And the MERS had three different revisions. So it's gone through many, many lifetimes. Some of you may remember it started off with a blue cover. Sometimes I pull out my books and show everybody how it has changed over the years. And it had a blue cover and then it had a, a ring binding, which was terrible. And all the pages used to fall out. And now it looks like this. It, we, these are actual books, by the way, in case anyone was curious. I was, these are actual books that we read. And I even have used it. See, I keep little tabs in it. So these are um, tools that, that practitioners can use and have used and have been around for a long time. Next slide. There it is. And this is a little bit of what William was talking about. You'll see a version of the MERS, the actual book, and then there's a version of the Sphere Handbook. And then these are the st humanitarian standards that you may be familiar with and have seen over the years. And this is the page on the left, uh, right hand side rather. This is the page where the MERS themselves live. And there's an interactive handbook that you can click through and go directly to individual standards. So, and these individual standards, which we'll see in the next slide, are really important. This is the heart of the MERS. So let's go and have a look at what's inside this actual book. Oh, let's skip this one. There we go. So inside this actual book, we have the standards themselves. And those are the written standards, like, for instance, markets will, uh, sorry, uh, uh, interventions will be risk aware and adaptive. That's a standard. That's what you have to do. You have to, you know, have your interventions be risk aware and adaptive. And then there'll be key actions under each standard. And these are the actions or the actual tasks you would take, right? To ensure that you are being adaptive and risk aware. So it's there are directives there. The standards are qualitative, they're not quantitative. It doesn't say you will have 400 adaptive and risk aware interventions, right? So that doesn't make sense. Um, but the actions, the indicators, and the guidance notes give you very specific activities on the actions, indicators, which shows, are you actually doing it? And then the guidance notes are the explanation, the examples. Um, we work in incredibly different contexts. Um, sometimes even within our own context, within a number of months, our context will shift. And so the guidance notes are there to help contextualize those standards and provide examples. And so they're a really important part of the MERS and, and really need to be read. Um, sometimes people just read the standard and they say, wow, that's too general. How could I even apply that? It doesn't make sense. But if you don't get down into the guidance note, everything is going to sound too general. So that's always my sort of tip when looking at standards ever and the MERS specifically, you have to read the guidance note to understand what in the world being risk aware and adaptive means to the MERS. Because being risk aware and adaptive means something different to everybody. You know, if I'm a mechanic, being risk aware and adaptive is going to mean something different than if I'm a humanitarian market systems practitioner. And what it means to a humanitarian market systems practitioner is in the guidance notes. And that's what needs to be sort of looked at and explored. And we'll do some of that in our case study work when we get to the breakout rooms. We can go to the next slide. I'm going to move a little quickly because I'm really here to just introduce the tool. And the important part really is Anne, where the tool gets used. Um, these are the MERS. There are core standards, which mirror what happens with Sphere. It'll be very similar and, and familiar to you. The assessment and analysis standards are assessment and analysis standards that sound applicable across sectors, but again, in the guidance notes, they are developed specifically around market systems, livelihoods, and connecting with that market community, not just assessing and analyzing um, in general for humanitarian work. The assessment and analysis standards are connected to the MISMA, which is the market, uh, what does the MISMA stands for? The MISMA is the market systems analysis standards, and they are connected to the MISMA, but they are more specific. They really are delving into um, markets that you will be intervening in, as opposed to just assessing for the point of assessing. The enterprise and market systems development standards are often called the heart of the MERS, and that's where a lot of the livelihoods work lies. The asset distribution standards includes both physical assets and cash. So there is cash guidance, clearly. 
Um, the financial services standards are about engaging with the financial service community, which is a necessity in all of these actions. And the employment standards are about looking at the labor market. And they are connected to other standards and other practices that look at labor market analysis. Some of you may know the Clara or other tools, but the employment standards really are about the markets where that employment sits. Um, we can click through and you're going to see a tree come up. And so this is the this is the way the standards look. They're designed to be underneath each of these. So under the core standards is a set of individual standards. Under the assessment and analysis standards is another set and so on and so forth. And there are about 29, well, there aren't about, there are 29 standards under the MERS. And so each of these categories has specific standards and there are 29 in total. Now, 29 is a lot. <laughs> it's less than we started out with. We had more before, so we got it. We, we really focused in, but we still have 29. So as you'll see on the next page, you know, the on the next slide, sorry. Um, having 29 standards can be really difficult. Um, the key point here is that you're not working with all 29 standards all the time. All 29 standards are not going to be applicable at every point in your project design cycle. All 29 standards are not going to be appropriate in every context. You may work with one or two standards at any one given moment. One or two standards might be priority for you to look at. Um, and they're not going to be in constant use. Um, oftentimes, and you, as you monitor, evaluate, and iterate in your program cycle, that's when you're going to want to check in with those standards. And we'll hear some of that from Anne, and Anne will sort of talk us through what Dreams did. Um, when you're designing, you may want to be referring to different standards than you were looking at in the monitoring, evaluation, and iteration phase. Because as you're designing, you may want to be looking at some of those practical key actions and see if you're taking them. Um, part of the art of using any standards is figuring out which ones are most applicable to the work you're doing at any one time. And so I really encourage you, we keep putting that link into, uh, into the chat to use those interactive standards. And that interactive standards allows you to go into, for instance, the core standards. Can we just back up a one slide, Dan? Just for instance, just as a quick example, if you wanted to go into the financial services standards and you wanted to see very specifically if you were going to have the ability to open it up and work with a financial service provider, it's going to be there. You're going to look specifically at working with financial service providers and what are the key actions to do that to make sure you're meeting a minimum activity. So these really can be great guidance tools. Okay, sorry, thanks, Dan. We can go back and click through to the next one. So as I said, using the standards is really the most important thing we can do. And I'd like to turn it over to Anne, who's gonna really talk us through a case study of using these standards and having that activity in the field. And um, mm -hmm. as we mentioned earlier, in the Q&A, we have the opportunity to put questions in as they come up for you. Um, and over on your left-hand side, you can certainly go into the expo and look at the standards as you're listening to Anne. Um, and, you know, as she mentioned certain standards, looking them up in that interactive handbook and seeing what she's talking about in a separate window is an interesting thing to be able to do. So, Anne, I'd like you to just introduce yourself to our group here and let everybody know who you are and uh, let's hear about the DREAMS program. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. So, hello everyone. So, I'm Anwa Hinya. I'm based here in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, working at Global Communities as a humanitarian assistance officer, and uh, previously as a DREAMS program coordinator, still at Global Communities. Um, I have a bit of a call, but I will definitely take you through. Uh, I'm going to take you through the minimum economic recovery standards, uh, a case study. Uh, from the Global Communities Dreams program that we implemented in Kenya. Thank you. So, uh, for those who are not familiar with the Dreams program, um, you know, Dreams is a development project, and uh, the goal of this program is to reduce HIV infections among adolescent girls and young women 
uh, it's implemented in many countries uh, across the world uh, in uh, uh, countries where the HIV rates are high. And uh, Global Communities implemented the DREAMS program for five years. That was from 2016 to 2019. And uh, one of the really key um, components of this program is economic empowerment, uh, where you get to really, at the end of it, before you graduate the girls, that they're economically empowered to be able to achieve sustainable program outcomes. Next. So uh, we had uh, a two-path approach to economic empowerment in the DREAMS program. One was a vocational skills pathway. And in this pathway, we trained girls and placed them in vocational training uh, courses of their choice. And then also we, uh, we mentored and linked them to existing opportunities. We also had a business startup pathway. And in this pathway, we would train girls in financial literacy and entrepreneurship. And then we would actually support them to start businesses and to develop by developing business plans. We'd mentor the girls um, and then we'd provide them with some startup kits uh, based on their business interest and based on the business plans that they had developed. Thank you, next. So, um, at one point we were facing, we realized um, we were facing some challenges uh, in economic empowerment um, that we, we will share later, but some of those were that some of the girls' businesses were collapsing and not making it past the six month period. And we started asking ourselves why uh, and what could be happening. So two, two of our staff in the DREAMS program got an opportunity to participate in a mass training and from that training is where we came back with the mass standards and decided to use the mass to review the economic empowerment component of the project to see whether we could really understand um, how to address the gaps and challenges that that we were facing of you know girls businesses not sustaining themselves or the vocational the girls who had learned vocational uh, skills training not being able to access any employment or have clients. Um, so we used MAS and uh, uh, we had a program advisory committee made up of external stakeholders uh, from government, civil society, um, and then a technical advisory committee made up of staff and the adolescent girls and young women themselves. And we just used the standards to review and assess the program. And I'll just show you uh, how we did that using some sample standards. So this, uh, uh, I'll share four standards. I'll use the mass core standards. Uh, for those of you who are at the link, uh, I'll just show you how we assess the program using the standards um, and what are the key actions we took after we assessed. So for the core standard one, for example, that says that humanitarian program should be market aware, uh, all the program and design implementation decisions should consider the context the market system dynamics and the local communities. And uh, it is very, very critical that market systems programming starts with the needs of the target beneficiaries or the target groups. So when we assessed this standard against um, the DREAMS program, what we realized is that initially we, did, we had not conducted a market assessment. And what that did is that it led to market saturation and competition among beneficiaries and also we realized that uh, some of the interventions we implemented negatively distorted the local markets in those communities. So we took some key actions. Um, we adapted a market assessment tool uh, with input from quite a number of stakeholders. And we used that tool to conduct a joint market needs assessment uh, with our stakeholders and the girls. And then we shared those results with stakeholders. We also then went ahead and assessed what is the demand? What is the market demand for the vocational skills courses and training we were offering girls to avoid oversaturation and just ensure girls have access to employment opportunities? And then we made sure we included in the entrepreneurship training, we were talking about market-based economic opportunities to girls. And just saying that um, 
you really have to look before you choose a course, what is the demand for that course or the skills course that you want to undertake in the market? Is there a market for it? Are you going to be able to get clients? So that is how we assessed um, course standard one. We can go to the second standard. Uh, we also looked at course standard two. And again, I'll only share four samples of this uh, because we are going to do a few more in the case study. So in the course standard two, uh, the standard says that efforts are coordinated to improve effectiveness for maximum efficiency, coverage, effectiveness, uh, interventions should be planned and implemented in coordination with relevant authorities, humanitarian agencies, CSOs, and private, sect private sector actors. And coordination is both within, internal, within the organization, and also external to with other stakeholders. So we assessed this. We thought this is pretty straightforward. It's something we had been doing. But what we discovered is that uh, we had not been coordinating well with local authorities to understand the legal business requirements. And that led to girls being charged a small fee uh, for them to be able to operate their businesses that we had not foreseen. And then it is very, very critical. We were not informed of the responsibilities, the objectives, and the, what is the coordination role of government authorities and any other relevant coordination body when it comes to the business operating environment. Uh, we found there were hidden costs and hidden charges uh, that we had not really anticipated. So we went back and some of the key actions now we undertook was to conduct a thorough stakeholder analysis. Uh, we realized that, of course, there are some partners and stakeholders who are very critical, such as the private sector, the business community who had been left out. Um, and this time we decided to be very, very inclusive and include them. And then we coordinated now with the local authorities. Here we call them the city council. Uh, other NGOs that were working in those communities and private sector actors. Just to ensure that we are all implementing a coordinated approach and that helped us to avoid duplication of efforts. And then to identify what are the existing market opportunities and what is the current uh, operating uh, legal business environment. Uh, we also had a sub-county and ward advisory committee that is uh, basic at the smallest geographic uh, level. And we did an after action review with them. And they really told us what, what, um, what are some of the stakeholders we've really been leaving out and uh, not engaging. So we really went down and identified these other small groups and uh, civil society organizations that were also doing some form of economic empowerment at a very, very minimal level, but we needed to also coordinate with them. And then we all uh, between stakeholders. Initially, uh, we were just meeting quarterly on a quarterly basis as stakeholders. We thought, yes, when we meet quarterly, we share information. Uh, we realized that's not enough. And we went an extra mile in putting an information sharing mechanism uh, between stakeholders, especially those of us who are implementing economic empowerment activities. Next slide. So looking at the cost standard three, it says that staff should have relevant skills uh, in terms of um, these should be individuals who understand economic recovery principles and or have access to technical assistance. And that the program should include some capacity building component to improve the relevant economic skills of staff. When we assess this standard against the DREAMS program, we realized that uh, the program staff did not have the expertise to navigate the local market dynamics. And uh, because of that lack of expertise, even if we had general economic empowerment expertise, uh, looking at the market systems, uh, it led to ineffective program implementation in that we were good at making sure the girls got the vocational skills training, uh, took the girls through mentorship business startup kits, but we sort of like missed out in terms of how do you now navigate the local market dynamics. So we took some key actions and uh, one of it was that we agreed that we need to equip the staff with knowledge and skills to navigate those local market dynamics that we were coming across 
uh, including uh, how do you now do a market systems analysis, uh, value chain development and enterprise development. And so two staff then were, were recommended and they attended the mass training. Um, but this was now phase two of it. So just to, for them to get some expertise in market systems development and economic empowerment. Then we continued to conduct ongoing monitoring for feedback and to address and support uh, any emerging issues as we were learning uh, and applying the mass standards. And, and the last cost standard, cost standard four, in the next slide. Um, if we can move to the next slide. I don't know if it has. Yeah. Can you can you see it, Anne? Maybe it's just loading for you. So do no harm. Um, Let me go back and forward. <laughs> uh, Sarah, I don't know who is screen sharing, but you can move yeah, to it's, it's the me. fourth slide. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I'm we're not on. It. Ah, okay. Maybe. Okay, can you see the change there, Anne? I'm back. We should be on assessing core standard four, do no harm. So, and you can what go you ahead. Say, you can go ahead and, and talk about core standard four. We have the slide up on our screen. Hello, Sarah, are you there? I am, and I think maybe you can't hear us, and I don't know why, but we can hear you. So I'll send you a, a type in the chat that we can hear you, and you have core standard Okay, I think up. maybe it has hanged, but I can just take you through core standard four. Uh, the core standard four is do no harm. And uh, in do no harm, this is a common uh, humanitarian principle. And it just says that the design, uh, implementation, outputs and environmental impacts of economic recovery interventions address or minimize potential harm, and they do not ex Yes, it has now loaded. Yes, so I'm okay now. Thank you. Uh, it, it, it does not lead to further economic disparity, conflict or protection risks, or even to undermine the rights of beneficiaries. Um, against the, the DREAMS program. And what we realized is that we had not adequately considered what potential risks uh, of market saturation and competition and what that could do. And this really led to negative Im impacts on beneficiary lives as we will read in the case study. So we took some key action. One, we conducted a risk assessment to identify and address any potential harm to beneficiaries, including market saturation, competition, and legal requirements. What we realized is that though we had conducted an initial risk assessment, we had really not looked at, at it from the point of view of, now let's look at what, is there any potential harm to these beneficiaries due to the local market system? And um, we went ahead and made sure we now did a, market, a risk assessment focusing on that. Yes, so then um, we also looked at participant safety and security and making sure it is as enhanced. As a result of participating in the program, the safety and security of beneficiaries should be of utmost importance. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, then also we reviewed the market regulatory framework, the existing market regulatory framework, and supported the law lesson girls to also comply and understand some of the government regulations, uh, such as tax, you know, um, such as also paying for the city council fees. Uh, so we helped the beneficiaries to also understand that. And then we also engaged and held dialogue with the local authorities and really explained to them who our beneficiaries are and the kind of support we were giving them 
to foster a more supportive uh, business environment. Next slide. So this is just uh, one of our photos. Like I said, that one of the things we were doing is to distribute startup kits. And these are startup kits for girls to, to cook. Um, we usually make like French fries just outside your house. You have this jiko, we call it a jiko. And um, it just uh, is easy, an easy business to start up because you don't need like to look for a shop and you can just start your business there. And these were very effective, but it was too much for girls and some other startup kits we also gave we gave the girls. So I'll stop here and hand it back to Sarah so that then we can go into the case study and then come back to, to finish this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And yeah, it is. So Betty, I agree with you. It's, it's amazing how, it's amazing how when you spend a little time with standards, you say, oh yes, of course we're doing that. And then once you look into some of the problems you're having, Sometimes what we discover is that we are doing it, but there are pieces we're not doing. Or we are doing it, but we're not doing enough of it. Or we are doing it, but we're not talking to the right people. And sometimes mm. that's really where standards can show their value. But let's actually do something together. Let's try this together. So what we're going to do, so we're at the nine o'clock hour, or my nine o'clock, your top of the hour, wherever you are. And we are going to go into a breakout room for about 15 minutes. Actually, no, once not about 15 minutes. And that's it. 15 minutes. We're cutting it off. <laughs> and in those 15 minutes, you're going to be presented with a case study based on dreams. And Anne mentioned there were a lot of things that were challenging. There were problems. We're about to dive into some of those problems together. And we're going to look at each case study. Uh, we're going to look at the case study. We're going to look at a standard. So there are three standards here. I'm going to be running one group and we'll be running another. And I just like to ask, so uh, one of our other colleagues, Shoshana, was going to be with us, but I'm not sure if her connectivity is good and she's functional. Shoshana, Dan, can you just give me a thumbs up if we've we've got that working for ourselves? Uh, yeah, I think she said that she's all good. Uh, Shoshana, if you can click share audio and video, we can test it out. Okay, so we'll get that going. And then uh, we, each of us will be looking at, hi, there you are. Welcome, Shoshana. Um, Shoshana is like me, someone who's been involved in the MERS since, uh, since its inception and has stayed on and is one of our advisory committee members and uh, works with Trickle Up, uh, which I'm sure many of you know, uh, very focused on refugee populations. So, you know, firmly rooted in the work we're doing here. So Shoshana will be running one of the groups and will be running another and I'll be running one. And we're going to look at this question, which is where do you see this case study went wrong? We all love a straw man, right? We all love to poke holes and stuff. Um, where do you see it went wrong? And what might they do? Here we are, Anne. We're all here to help, Anne. <laughs> what might they do to be more responsive to the MERS standard that we're going to look at? So one group will be looking at being adaptive and risk aware, and that's uh, enterprise and market systems development standard three. Another group will be looking at enterprise and market systems development standard four, which is working with existing market actors and using facilitation approaches. And the final group will be looking at employment standard two, which is interventions are labor market based. So we're gonna see what this case study can learn about the case study, which is brief, and what could we do to be more responsive to the standards? We got to just reviewing uh, the mass standards and actually reading the case study because we, we didn't manage to have it on the screen. Mm -hmm. So we were about to go into the discussions when we came back into the breakout, ah. uh, from the breakout room. We were <laughs> just about to have a conversation. So it seems uh, for us, we missed an opportunity mm -hmm. to discuss, but uh, we reviewed the mass standard and that one we were looking at, that uh, programs are adaptive and risk aware. Um, so that is, that is what I can say about our session, but we did go through the case study and mm -hmm. also go through the mass standard itself. And um, what I can say is that uh, the mass standard is very interactive. 
most of the participants were able to actually go into it and oh, find great. the enterprise and market systems development standards and go right into the standard we wanted to, to assess. So that's the feedback I'll give for my breakout room. Thank you, Anne. That's excellent. And we're very lucky because we have the opportunity. So Shoshana, Shoshana has gotten locked out from us. So um, I guess we will have a difficulty uh, hearing back from her. Are you with us again? Shoshana, do you want to unmute yourself? I think there you are. Hi. Sorry, um, but I do need to run in just a few minutes. But I ha we had a great conversation and really heard. Um, so what we were looking at um, was the fact that there were some over there were too many people in the market and um, the our, our, the participants were, were given, um, were doing similar things that a lot of other people were doing. And so what we really found out of the importance of, of thinking about looking at doing proper assessments, doing stakeholder engagement, and, and really understanding, involving the market actors in our decisions around the types of programs that we wanna do and how we wanna support our participants. So it was a really, great kind of the, the, so many of the things like as we all say is things that we think about and we think that we're doing but we want to make sure that we're not um saturating the market with so many people doing what what what's going out there um so there's really important to understand um and understand those gaps that may be out there um so it was a great conversation really really glad to be a part of it and just a reminder of the things that we think we need to do, it's really helpful to take the time and look at that. I'm sorry I have to run, but it's been a pleasure. And thank you to my group for, for a great conversation. Thank you, Shoshana. Look at us going with our problems and dealing with our struggles online. Look at us go. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Um, I, I want to mm -hmm. say that having those conversations together and, and hearing that case study, I think many of us said, oh, my goodness, are we still here? Are we still having these challenges? And the answer is yes. And they're not going to go away because what the work that we do when we engage with markets and helping people develop livelihoods or helping people work in a cohesive way across that nexus. Yes, I said nexus. Um, is actually hard work and it is complex work. And I think that's the reason that standards can be helpful. And part of this learning is that Anne and her team were confident that they were moving in the right direction. They were confident that they had looked at these different aspects. They were confident they engaged with the right stakeholders and they still encounter challenges and problems. And that idea of being agile, the idea of re-looking at things, the idea of recognizing those challenges and trying to adapt, that's what the MERS can help us do. And that's what market systems work is really about, not to be a plug for market systems. But Anne, I'd like to hand it over to you now. Tell us what really happened. You know, we went into our breakout room mm -hmm. and we said, oh, we should do this. And oh, they should do this. And it's always easy to be like, poke, poke, poke. That was a problem. And there's a problem. Did that wrong. But tell us what really happened. So I'll hand it over to Anne to talk us through yeah. the real thing. Thank you. Yes. So what, what, did, what did dreams actually do? So what changed? Uh, you've had now the case study. Uh, we have now conducted the assessment. We realized we needed to do all these things. I showed you, you know, we did a risk assessment, a Dara market assessment. We started engaging with the city council. So what changed? Yeah. Uh, one of the best things that really occurred is that we actually started identifying viable market opportunities. And we encouraged girls to pursue less saturated businesses. So that reduced competition and improved their chances of success. Uh, so we came up with very innovative partnerships by engaging stakeholders. And through that, we were able now to provide demand-driven vocational skills training, uh, which ensured that uh, the training aligned with the local market demands so that that created employment for that I have these skill sets, I can actually get clients in this local market. Um, then we also streamlined regulations and we supported the girls' businesses by collaborating with the local authorities and the city council. And what we agreed is that the city council would waive the fee for the girls for, the, for, the, for six months uh, until their businesses stabilized and then they would start paying that money because 
eventually if you've not even started making a profit you're still learning the the trade and you're being demanded to pay your 20 shillings then it becomes very very challenging we also agreed with the local authorities that even if a girl is not able to raise this money please do not take away their product so we had dialogue and we really talked to them about it then of course like i said we had to put in place an information sharing system which improved coordination with the OVC program uh, to avoid duplication of efforts and maximize impact. Yes, it was nice that, um, you know, sometimes we see very good innovative economic empowerment models and we want to adapt them. But I think it's also good to go in and really learn and collaborate together. Because then from there, you might even implement and do a better job based on learnings. Uh, and gaps and uh, information sharing. Uh, then we created a beneficiary feedback mechanism uh, to address any emerging issues. We realized that uh, it's very, very dynamic. And sometimes if beneficiaries feel that they don't have a way of giving feedback or asking for help, then they get stuck and uh, they keep quiet. Um, and then we made sure that any asset that girls are being given really does align, not only with their aspirations, but also the local market, market demands. And then we engaged now with all stakeholders, anyone who had an influence on the local markets, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the government, the local gatekeepers, we had also brokers uh, who come in and, and there were all these other players that we really needed to have considered. So these are some of the things we changed. And uh, I'll just show you some photos of some of the businesses, for example, we started changing into and the girls undertook. We established, for example, a private uh, sector partnership uh, with uh, a company which allowed girls to, to train on how to wash cars, which is a male dominated field in Kenya. And they were doing very, very well. We also ventured into agribusiness um, there were girls who are now doing agribusiness and supplying the local, the local market with food instead of all of them doing tailoring and hairdressing and, um, and carpentry courses, which uh, already led to a lot of oversaturation in the market. Um, I don't know. I can't see the photo. Maybe you can see it from your side. The next slide. Yeah, we just had the photos. Let me know up. once you can see the next slide. Yes, yeah, we're on the lessons learned now. From my end. Yes, we've got. So we we saw the photos. My favorite car washing photo of all time. And now we're on lessons learned. You can go ahead and with lessons learned. Okay, so I'll go ahead on lessons learned. Um, in terms of the lessons learned, in t uh, applying the mass, what did we learn? Now, uh, this is specifically to the DREAMS program. It is important to align skills training with market, market needs. Yeah, sometimes we think we really know. Uh, we have talked to, you know, we've gone to the field, we've gone to the ground, but it is very, very critical to make sure that even as you offer these skills training, for example, vocational training programs, they must be able to meet the specific needs of the local market. Otherwise, then we will just be churning out and saying, yes, we have empowered girls and we've done this. But then when it comes to getting clients, to providing their services, making sure they're making an income, it becomes difficult. And of course, data market assessments cannot be uh, overemphasized. Being a development program, uh, we may not have seen the need to really go deeply and data into into market assessments. But now what we learned is that um, in any economic empowerment program, start with conducting a market assessment, but not just to look at both demand and supply side, also looking at other factors, including protection risks uh, for your beneficiaries, the legal business operating environment. So this needs to be very, very comprehensive because initially, the only thing we had done is to look at demand and supply side in the, in the market. Uh, and that will help to avoid saturation, competition, and also to make sure beneficiaries are protected. Then it's important to engage with local authorities, uh, government authorities, 
um, and to ensure uh, regulatory compliance. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's very, very critical that we are actually helping the beneficiaries to comply because sometimes the regulatory environment, it keeps changing. And sometimes there's a tax they are able to do. Some of the challenges, for example, the girls were facing was filing their tax returns, their business returns. And this can really put beneficiaries at risk and create problems which we had not foreseen. So really going in there and understanding what kind of regulations do uh, the beneficiaries need to comply with to be able to operate their businesses. And then establish a robust and continuous monitoring and um, learning framework. Uh, this really helps to identify and address emerging issues. And of course, that cannot be overemphasized that every day we are learning, continuous learning, adapting, being flexible. In fact, the one we were looking at about being adaptive and risk aware was really focusing on this. Uh, our programs must really be designed in such a way. We can be flexible that when we hit an issue, we are able to go back and learn, uh, relearn and unlearn and really listen in and see how, how else can we address emerging issues and implement our programs better. Um, and of course, flexibility in program design and management. Uh, it really helped us that we were flexible and also the management that is willing to be more flexible because sometimes we do um, programs that we are not flexible. And if we are not flexible, then that means that we are not able to change. Even if we learn, we are not able to apply those learnings in our programs. So flexibility in when you're designing the program, how you're implementing it is very, very critical because of the changing market conditions. Uh, currently, uh, because of inflation, sometimes is rising market prices and all these things, they really affect the market. And if a girl's business might be doing well today, but tomorrow it is affected by changing market conditions. And of course, we must always apply a do no harms lens to market chains, enterprises and market systems development. It is very, very critical that we are looking at the end person who is going to be the one doing the business, the, the beneficiaries. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to Sarah. Thank you, Anne. Yes, and, and that's, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, and yes, you tell us about the picture. Please do. Yes, the, so this is just a, a photo of the girls now graduating. Um, this is when we have now done the mass. And you can see now we are smiling. It is different. So thank you. <laughs> I'll thank you, and, and everybody looks great. You, Photos are my favorite part of all of this. Always, they really bring it to life. Thank you, Anne. I think that um, I think that everyone really. Uh, I know myself anyway. I can absolutely see my own work in that journey that dreams went through. I can absolutely see my own work and my own process all the different agencies I've worked with over the years, I can see a lot of the things that I've encountered and worked with across many contexts coming up in this dreams work that you've done. And I'd also just like to thank you and give you some applause for your honesty. I think a lot of us spend a lot of time talking about how everything we did was great and we're a bunch of geniuses and everything we do is always perfect. But the reality is, is we have challenges, we make mistakes, and when we learn from them, things get better. And so I just want to thank you, Anne, for coming in front of us and really presenting, here's what we did, here's how it went wrong, here's what we learned, here's what we changed. And I think that kind of honesty and openness is really important for our, our, our learning our, and, our, and our professional development. So thank you for that. And to bring it back to the MERS, and that's what the MERS can help us do, is remind ourselves what this is for and how it is done. And... I think even though Anne and the Dreams team, that's fun to say, was really effective at designing and putting a program together. And remember, this was a program around health, right? This was a health protection program. It had, it had an economic thrust, an economic component. But the idea of Dreams was coming out of a protective health environment. And I think many of you in different contexts 
have your economic programs come out of a protective wash environment, a protective shelter environment, a protective health environment. Perhaps it's a, a livelihood protection. There's a lot of different sectors we may work in, but we use economic programming to help people develop or improve in those sectors. And when we do that, the MERS is important for all of us to use. It really is cross-sectoral in that way because so much of the work we do is economic, uh, regardless of what outcomes we're trying to affect. We may be trying to improve health or improve shelter, but we're looking at income because we do that a lot, no matter what kind of program. We're looking at water process, but we're looking at improving income so people can install taps or pay water bills or access pumps, right? So these are things we do, and the MERS is applicable across that. Um, so I just wanted to hit that for you. And I'm just going to very quickly, and just answered one of the questions in our chat. So uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to butcher the name and I, uh, I apologize for that, but, um, Temesgen, Bariso Baleta mentioned that the idea of adapting this idea of us being pretty good at maybe figuring out what went wrong, but not very good at changing as we're working. So I think that that was one of the things, again, that using the MERS to assess the program and then having the opportunity to change how things are moving forward based on the learning of the MERS is a really important part of what we learned from Anne and the team. Anne, do you want to speak to that at all? Uh, maybe say a few words? Uh, yes. Yes. And again, it goes back to, to what we are saying. Uh, sometimes, yes, we are very good at, yes, we know what the issue is. Uh, but then we learn, yes. And adapting comes when we actually recognize that, yes, this is like where we went wrong and let's all recognize that. And this is how we can do things better. And it needs buy-in. Adapting needs buy-in from the staff. It needs buy-in from management, stakeholders and beneficiaries. So when you remember when I was sharing about um, how we used the mass, uh, the mass standards, one of the things the mass can do is to really help to do a gap analysis. And you do that with, you do that with the staff in the program and in the organization, but also with stakeholders and beneficiaries so that you're saying, look, this is what we are finding. And so that provides you with a basis for coming and saying, this is what we are learning and this is how we can adapt. Why? Because the mass gives some key actions and even indicators for you to check and see, okay, so if we apply this, is it going to, to get better and then assess? So that is what I would say about adapting. It really does need that buy-in to be able to adapt. You might really have some good learnings that you have, but if they are just for you, uh, sometimes I've seen we have learnings that we go and share out there. You know, maybe we'll go to a conference and say, oh, this is what we learned. But adapting requires us taking that extra initiative to share that information and really make sure you're getting buy-in from everyone to be able to adapt. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, that is really important. And I know that some of us on the call have had the experience of, you know, having a difficulty making our case for adapting. And one of the things I'll just point out, because the MERS have been around for a long time, because they're a recognized set of standards, because they're accepted in the industry, because they're a part of sphere, you can bring them along and say, look, these are the internationally recognized standards that we're not meeting, donor, government. We need to do it. We need to make this change. So it also affords you a level mm -hmm. of gravitas to make those changes and make your case, which can be very important and sometimes difficult in these complex analyses that we're doing. It can be hard to make a clear case for change. So Edward uh, asked us a question in the chat here that I'd like to try to get to in our last minutes. And it's about being in an emergency situation where host populations and crisis affected populations are very similar. And what are some of the risks or activities that you can be, that you can do to make sure that using the MERS is implemented across? And, and I think I'll take this one just because I know for Anne, the case study we talked about was in a, uh, there, were, there were women and girls who were in crisis situations themselves, but the environment in which they were operating was not necessarily in crisis at the time. Um, so in emergency situations where I have more experience and have spent more time, 
one of the things that the MERS does allow you to do is because it is, um, it's context agnostic. It doesn't matter who you're working with, whether you're working with host populations, refugees, internally displaced people, um, it's appropriate and, and, and applicable to all of those different groups. So one of the things you can do and, and, and does happen in most uh, environments where we're working in income is both host populations, refugee populations and displaced populations are having similar but not exactly the same struggles and they're often connected, right? So they're often connected, their market chains run through each other. They're working with the same suppliers, with the same financial service providers. A refugee population might not have access to the financial services because of legal status or different documentation reasons, whereas there might be other issues that your host population is having. But if you're using the MERS, you're going to see both of those challenges and you're going to be able to adapt programming to address both of those challenges. So one of the things the MERS does allow you to do is to look across those different populations we work in and treat them with the same kind of lens and answer similar questions about them. Um, another question that we have in there is, which I think is, mm -hmm. it might be difficult to address in the short term. Um, Habi Burriman asked, uh, first Anne, wonderful presentation, so that's a good thing. And then asked uh, how to include climate change across many of the, the minimum economic recovery standards. And I'll say that in the development of the economic recovery standards, we spent a lot of time thinking about cross-cutting themes, gender, um, conflict sensitivity, climate change, um, protection. What I would say is that uh, those cross-cutting issues are part of what we need to reinvigorate and relook at with SPHERE. So one of the things that is upcoming is a conversation with the practitioner community, with SPHERE, about how these cross-cutting issues like climate change, you heard, right? There's legs, there's livestock in there, there's seeds, there's the agricultural livelihoods standards in there, there's the MERS. And as we know, many of our populations focus on agricultural livelihoods across their economic work. So all of that is going to be critically important. Plus, we're working in crisis environments and crisis environments are exacerbated or sometimes created because of climate change. So I think that that's, that is our work going forward, um, Habibur, and I appreciate the question. And I guess the final question I want to just make sure we get over, and I know we're about a minute over, which I apologize for, but uh, I think we can get the last question in is in an emergency or ongoing conflict, and this is um, uh, Chiran, Chiranjibi uh, Rijal, I'm, I hope I got that close. Um, in an emergency or ongoing conflict, what, data what about data security and market assessments and cash and voucher programming? So service providers data. So this idea of data protection, um, I think this is something that especially as we become more and more invested and dependent on our technology to allow us scale and to allow us adaptability and scope in our work, this becomes more and more important. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the MERS answers this question strongly enough. And I think that in all, I will be very honest that, this, that data protection was not something in our last revision we spent enough time on. And I also believe that a lot of the cash and voucher standards um, don't have enough about data protection in them either. And I think that um, this is something that we as a community need to really get on board with and start thinking about more uh, clearly and get the right partners with us, the right tech partners who can help answer these questions and provide us with the right information and get the protection specialists with us as well. Some of the things that I've encountered in the past that have been challenges around this mm -hmm. are the idea of working with market actors and them saying, why am I going to give you my protected market data? Why would I give that to you? And who are you going to tell? And that's a very sort of basic, simple data protection issue beyond, you know, beneficiary uh, religious status or location being linked to nefarious groups mm -hmm. or something like that, which is also a concern. But the simple understanding of why data matters and who it's valuable to. And when we're looking at competition, right, Anne? And when we're looking at yes. uh, business opportunities, 
this is protected and valuable data. And so part of the MERS does address that piece of it in the assessment and analysis standards, but I think we have more work to do. So I'll take that question to heart. And hopefully as we move forward with the new revisions, this group and other groups like it will help us improve those standards and make them clearer and better. So on that note, I would like to close out our session. I'd like to thank all of you for bearing with us through this platform challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it has a lot of beautiful functions, so I'm not anti this platform, mm -hmm. um, but obviously I have a learning curve to, to get through. So if we use it again, I promise to be more adept. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be then, nice and, for some bigger events. Maybe yeah. if we have a full day events, we can we can play around with it. Maybe we'll have a full day merge training webinars. and we'll all get exactly, better. Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Dan, mm. just if you can pop one more time into the chat for everybody, the access mm. to the MERS interactive standards. And I'd like yes. to thank all of you for your time. And I'd like to go to the final slide, which is going to be our um, information and, and sort of connectivity and contact details and we'll leave that up and we'll leave this link open for anybody to click through it or answer any questions. As you can see, it's pointing you directly to Sphere. So just as a reminder for those of you who are used to connecting through SEEP, um, some of you may be, uh, Sphere is the new home of the MERS and they'll be taking that forward. So I'd like to thank everybody for your time and I would like to, yes, thank you, Rami. Yes, the, there's a lot of cash advisory work going on and there's a lot of different actors take, like engaging in this process. And mm. Sphere, happily, is engaged across all of those groups. And so we'll be able to really bring those voices into the room. Um, thank you so much for everybody's time and patience and grace during our, during our workshop and, and time together. So thank you all and thank you especially to Anne because I think really sharing your learning with us was excellent. Thank Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Great. See you Thank guys. you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a nice day.